Um, uh, flights out of time, Dada said, are a chronic prose. Um, the allusion to uh, Uwe Ball's um, Dada diary, Die Flucht aus der Zeit, Flight out of time, is entirely deliberate here. Just as Ball uh, turns the classical topos of uh, Fuga Temporis, the flight of time, on its head. So I'd like to challenge the idea here of a singular flight out of a singular time or temporality um, and propose to look at data in terms of heterochronia. Ball's diary chronicles and reflects on the author's trajectory between 1914 and 1920, a period that saw him turn his back on pre-war expressionism in Munich with Kandinsky, moved to Zurich, found the cabaret Voltaire, only for him to withdraw after several weeks from the intensity of Dada, to become first a political journalist, denouncing the intellectual foundations of German nationalism, abhorring the reality of the revolutions in Russia and in Germany, and then become a student of the patristic and gnostic writings of early Christianity. That's a bow embodies quite a range of identities, if you like. And in his diary, Bar dramatizes the U-terms of his trajectory as a flight from perhaps three kinds of time. You now the German singular, singular deep side is uh, the times in English. That's perhaps one of the meanings. So the times of violent upheaval, of war and revolution. But I think there are two more senses of time. Or dramatizes a, a flight from the temporal logic of modernity, modernity's belief in the linearity and unidirectionality of progression of history. And then also, finally, perhaps a flight from the temporal regime of modernity, a regime that imposes a universal time onto personal and social life, abstracting from the individuality of experience. So it's tempting then to read Baal's memoirs reflecting on a crisis of the temporal construction of modernity. And it's not difficult to find evidence of this. One entry which you have here for 18 April 1917 notes laconically, the central clock of an abstract period has exploded. It's not so much that time is out of joint, but the orderliness and rigidity of abstract normative clock time violently subverted. But this is actually an interesting entry. It consists of three parts. This is the final part. The preceding notes um, hint, I think, at a kind of differential temporality are emerging out of this explosion. We have there a gloss on Goethe's aesthetics and a note to the effect that the new art sought by Dada might actually provide some kind of insight into an earlier art. So Bauer's entry might show that Dada had a more complex relationship to history than the rhetoric of historical rupture and renewal would suggest, reversing the normative relation between new and old. And I think the German term normal carries this normative, normal sense in it. Um, reversing the normative relation between new and old, it gestures towards a sort of plural, disjunctive time frame that fits with Dada's playful and paradoxical dissolution of opposites. But I think there's also a tension in Baal's model of an escape from modernity's time or times, and in his search for an alternative temporality. On one hand, on one hand, we have the neat and almost obsessive dating of the individual entries that betrays a tendency shared by other Dadaists to document and historicize oneself and the movement over time. On the other hand, the diary also reveals perhaps strategically placed gaps of several weeks and sometimes months to suggest discontinuity and silence. It is as though Dada's exit from modernity's time remains ambivalently bound to the normative regime of modernity and to the demands placed on the documentation of the modern self. Similar tensions, I think, occur in other Dada attempts to position itself, themselves, 
against time and history. Here, perhaps, in the Tsavas, Koenigs of Ashuas, where the apparently simple, straightforward chronology becomes a Dada text in its own right, you know, even at first sight from the typography. Or on the right in uh, Dada Berlin's proclamation of a new calendar. Hausmann and Bader responsible for this. The new time begins in the year of the death of the Oba Dada, <laughs> which um, parodies both the calendrical fervor of political revolutions and reverses, like much of Dada, the natural logic of birth and death. So time for the Dadas is clearly not abstract and universal, but relative, variable, malleable. Yet even Dada's relativizing of time depends on that which it criticizes. And Dada's discursive and imaginative efforts to counter modernity are predicated on the very temporal idioms it wishes to subvert. So it seems more appropriate to describe Dada's critique of the temporal logic of modernity not as a counter discourse tackling modernity head on, but as a sort of alternative discourse tackling the temporal logic, the temporal structure upon which modernity is built. And by looking at some of the complex temporality in a number of Dada prose writings, the present paper suggests that Dada gestures towards heterochromic temporalities that both reflect and invert the normative regime of modernity. So I'll suggest a reading of heterochromia that's also animated by Foucault's heterology of the <coughs> space and the Bartin's literary concept of plurotemporality, Erasno of Reynianos. And the reason for my focus on prose is the close link between narration and time. Bartin regarded the novel as a genre that's permanently conceptualizing, newly conceptualizing time, or more precisely perhaps the generativity of narrative in time and over time that seems meant object of study here. So generativity of fantastic narrative and disavowal of continuity and chronology are certainly hallmarks of Hugo Ball's text, Tender End of the Fantast, written 1914 to 20, covering the same time as his Dada diary, and often regarded as a sort of fictional companion piece to Fly Drop. <coughs> Ball described it as a fantastic novel, but its uh, outrageous, stylistic and generic hybridity suggests it's more than that. Its 15 chapters alternate between prose and poetry, are linked by association only. The text is certainly heavily coded, hallucinatory events and happenings depicted generally take the form of allegories of same or similar events recorded in Bell's diary. So one reading of this fantastic text suggests that Baal presents himself as the titular fantast, setting out to redeem through his own visionary powers a fallen, a corrupted world, only to find himself caught in the same circle of corruption. The wide range of allegorical masks Baal adopts for himself then would undermine any notion of a stable self. It would also point to, the cha to its changeability over time. Indeed, as the name Laurentius Tenderenda implies, signifying a sort of collaged personage, half Christian martyr, St. Lawrence, who died a cruel death on burning coal, and who is recalled in the book's figure of the roasted poet, half linguistic construction by way of a Latin neologism based on the feminine form of the gerundif of tenderer. So the name suggests a figure needing to be extended, to be stretched, to occupy a fluid and indeed hermaphroditic identity. And Benjamin's model of allegory might have a bearing here too, sort of a series of avant-garde or auto-allegorizations here in Baal's text, in Baal's text embodying a sort of melancholic view of the passage of things. Indeed, some of the prose segments dramatize a sort of attempt at radical change or revolutionary rupture, which, however, never materializes, so that this is a text that casts doubt on the possibility of another utopian time to come. 
Now, Bowles' text, I think, deploys heterochronia in two main ways. First, it uses a number of objects whose circulation within the narrative suggests heterochronia. There is, for example, in an early episode, a carousel horse named Johann. And here on the right-hand side, uh, the cover of uh, Jonathan Hammer's English translation, and Hammer also provided sort of collages uh, at the bottom and on the cover pages, his imagined carousel horse, Johann. Yeah, you see the androgynous, multifarious assemblage identity there. Yeah? And so the carousel horse, which becomes the object of affection, idolization even, for some radical poets, who call themselves the Blue Tulip Group, a mild allusion to Bauer's own embrace of the pure purgative art of Kandinsky and the Blue Riders. Like the figures who populate Bauer's text, the carousel house is initially associated with what Foucault would call festival time, the world of the fairground, of circus, on the periphery of a city, set apart from but remaining within the normative time of modernity and providing an experience of time that is intensely flowing and transitory. During the course of the episode, Baal's poets are canny enough to anticipate the imminent outbreak of war in Europe and transport horse and carousel to safety in the Libyan desert, where, however, they are detained by a German army officer for removing the horse from the reach of the military authorities who need the horse for war purposes. The poets escape on horseback in order to evade what the text calls the polluted, corrupted world of Europe, its nationalism, militarism, its logic and reason. And their escape, however, leads nowhere, for even when detached from the carousel, the horse returns the riders to the very desert where their escape began. So Baal plays, obviously, with the horse's identity, which is at once a toy horse, a real horse, and an ambivalent emblem of alternately artistic avant-garde and nationalistic desires. Along with the spatial displace displacement here, away from conflict in Europe to Northern Africa, Baal's text is deploys the horse as a heterochronic object to suggest not escape from the violence of modernity, but repetition, being caught in the same circle. In this episode, as in the text as a whole, time is flexible, but figured as cyclical and circular. In the case of the horse, this involves not merely repetition of what's gone before, but also anticipation. For one reading of the horse is as an anticipation of the French meaning of dada, as hobby horse, so that the heterochronic object becomes a symbol for temporal anticipation. An anticipation that entirely conforms with Bauer's assessment of his fantastic novel as a self-critique written in advance. It's a wonderful phrase, self-critique written in advance. Another way in which Bauer suggests heterochromia is through uh, poetic speech. Interspersed uh, across the narrative are uh, alternately hymns, lamentations, and parody, liturgical forms, and the entire repertoire of Baal's sound poems. These poems constitute heterochronic moments in two ways. I think their genre and form add to the generativity of Baal's text, that I talked about earlier, and their language, parody, glossolalia, deliberately confounding meaning and communication, their language points to deregulated speech that belongs to a time before and beyond the convention of so-called natural languages, national languages also, used as a means of communication and nation building, of course. So Bauer might deploy here what Bakhtin calls heteroglossia, speech that resists subordination under a single authority. And this heteroglossia might constitute another way of conceiving time, a kind of multi-temporality, a varied temporality, by which literary language is able to provide an image of many different kinds of time at once, from the mythical and natural 
to the historical and man-made. Bartini developed his idea of multi-temporality in relation to Goethe and to Goethe's art of nature writing, describing landscape as forever changing, that sort of geomorphology, we might say, full of potentiality and becoming. And in the case of Baal's Dada poems, multi-temporality is perhaps more overtly attached to language itself, the vocalization, the performance, the reading of these poems, suggesting access to some deeper level of language as Baal himself uh, asserted in his famous Magic Bishop episode. So in their heterochronic potentiality, the poems might constitute a mode of expression which exceeds individual speech, and as Baal put it somewhere else, simultaneously weakened and strengthened the lowest strata of memory. Weakening, strengthening, shuttling back and forth in time, past, present, performance, future. If Baal's uh, fantastic narrative suggests heterochronia through fantastic objects and linguistic moments, and then Raoul Hausmann, the Berlin Dadaist, deploys satire and montage to demarcate the complex temporalities of Berlin Dada. Hausmann wasn't only with Hannah Hirsch a pioneer of photo montage, but during the early years of the Weimar Republic, he published a raft of essays, manifestos, and satires which, like Dada as a whole, attacked the German cult of interiority, fetishization of high culture, and the resurgence of nationalism and militarism in Germany. While the direction of these satiric attacks is clear, the generic identity of these writings is less clear. One of Hausmann's manifesto essays is titled Schnitt durch die Zeit, Cut through time or through the times, um, so as a textual equivalent, maybe, of photo montages, his Dada satires cut through the textual material encountered in the German mass media and allude to contemporary figures and events by way of quotation, direct or defamiliarized, by way of allusion, parody, and also fictionalization. So his Dada montages, I would say rather than collages, um, his texts juxtapose heterogeneous languages and registers. And their satirical interventions into contemporary German politics and culture, they occupy a paradoxical temporality, cutting through the contemporary age to mock and debase its <coughs> untimely pretensions, and at the same time exposing the contemporary age as temporally unstable and chaotic. Some of these satires are, coll are collected in Hausmann's 1921 book, Hurrah, 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 no translation in the end, of course. They showed quite nicely. I think how heterochronic effects might be produced in satire. So a number of these satires focus on real political figures, Hindenburg, Ebert. Others involve fictional personae, the most prominent of these being a figure named Pufke. An embodiment of the German bourgeois male whose trajectory and outlook point to a pattern of political and economic opportunism through war, revolution and restoration. Like Baal's tenderender, these setters present the times as being in flux and, the, and as rendering the individual superfluous. In the story, Pufke yearns for the Middle Ages. Hausmann's figure exhibits a retrogressive desire for the security of feudal pre-modernity. Martin would say this is a figure that inhabits national historical time, flitting back and forth in his phantasmatic desires, um, and projecting his own fantasies of German nationalism and economic success, of individual fame and immortality onto the Middle Ages. But the Hausmann's montage foregrounds not just formal, but also temporal and spatial discontinuity, when suggesting that Pufke had prematurely strayed into the Middle Ages. Hausmann presents his figures, present and Middle Ages, as places where he becomes lost, where his figure becomes lost. And his temporal fantasy and a spatial desire, which proves fatal.
Yeah, so we have a Bartinian chronotope here, yeah, quite nicely constructed in this set I have. As well as showing the impossibility of an escape from modernity, if it's constituted in its German national imaginary. Hausmann presents uh, Hausmann's satire as uh, take aim at political and artistic utopias. Pufke completes the world revolution, is another piece. Shows his figure indulging in fantasies of Germany's greatness and becoming global, colonial, and economic power. And Pufke propagates prolet cult, the new art form uh, designed to bring art to the socialist masses becomes co-opted by capitalism, which results in the culture industry based on light entertainment. So through montage, I think Hausmann set a show how heterochronia take the form of simultaneity also, for various temporal fantasies, regressive, progressive, concerned with continuity or rupture, converge in the montage text. So satire as montage then becomes a form with which to render the chaos and disjunction of post-revolutionary Germany. And it's also a form that organizes Dada's playful and aggressive attack on the temporal regime of modernity, thus making manifest another heterochrome temporality, I might say, free of the fetishization of past and future. And just how important this construct of Pufke was for Hausmann. You can see in the opening of his uh, manifesto, Presentism, yeah, or against the Pufkeism of the German soul. Yeah. And I won't read it out, but you see sort of Dada's temporal aesthetic here as a, as a structural model of heterochronia yeah, that combines political, formal, artistic attack on virtually everything of the time, yeah, bearing in mind a very specific temporality. I mean, yeah. So where Hausmann and Wagner uh, produced heterochronic effects out of fantastic narrative and satire, Tristan Zara turned to the memorial and the autobiographical mode in his text Fat Bourgeux, a 15-piece sequence written after his falling out with Breton and Paris Dana. Here he looks back to his Romanian origins and the Dana experience in Switzerland and France, Using French, the language of his newly adopted culture, Zara dramatizes himself as a man with the past, but a man who is unstable and forever elusive on account of social, ethnic, geographic, linguistic estrangement. Zara has organized his text on a number of metaphorical ideas. Place your bets, the gambling metaphor, which is gradually superseded by the chess metaphor, Ishak, and that also hints at failures, yeah, always not completing, not succeeding. So here he aligns the memorial mode with Dana's game play and the subversive deployment of chance. But I think a stronger metaphor is that of the body that organizes the text. The sequence begins with the heart and ends with the head. Head also doubling, the heart in the heart, head to head. The doubling and layering suggesting the process of the doubleness, doubleness of the remembering self. And what is more, the body is presented as diseased and infected. One section is called the tentacular head. A grotesque body that in the process of remembering always becomes other than the norm. I think there is a difference to the grotesque body of Hausmann's Pufke. In Sarah, the body is not subject but object, the material foil upon which the effects of time and memory are inscribed. One section, and you have a few quotes from that section, describes Sarah's first arrival in Zurich, a city in which he stayed by chance and settled by weakness. The birthplace of Dada, so familiar from historiography, becomes unfamiliar here. First through the body metaphor, la vie, non vie, tulips. And then through a double form of estrangement, I won't read uh, out everything. But if Zurich is a metaphor for the self's estrangement from itself, then so is the experience of time in that place. The days kicked alternately into the pedals of my body, days with clenched fists. 
Time's body blows better than the poet's excellent body. Zara then describes joining artistic communities in Zurich and Dada's energetic protest showing up the holes of reason. And if this description is meant to resolve the trauma of estrangement, it fails to do so, as the poet is left to mourn the slow derailing of those invertebrate and heterogeneous hours experienced in Zurich. It's so more than just about the more than just a lament about the passage of time. Temporality here is physiological, but one that is out of sync with evolution and history, and resists being subjected to the linearity of time and modernity, and ends up being derailed. Another reference of many antecedents of the surrealist train metaphor, trains and organized timetables, and so on. Finally, the fluid and physiological temporality resists language. What expression would be rigorous enough before the inexpressible navigation of time that never sleeps and never hides? So in this complex sentence here, the body has become heterochronic object and moment simultaneously. And Zara pinpoints nicely the heterochronic principle. The self is subject to another temporal and linguistic regime the time and language of becoming, in Sarah's case, the time and language and physiology of always becoming other. It's two sentences, two more sentences. So I think Dada's complex temporalities point to the presence of others, other times, the dizzying and challenging experience of inhabiting and moving between different times simultaneously that seems to be created in these prose writings. And I think they constitute more than the singular flight of modernity, singular times, um, singular time, rather. And I think they suggest one way, a sort of structural mode that challenges, finds temporarily a way out of the hegemonic exclusionary logic of modernity, imposing one time at the expense of others. So in other words, um, Dada points to temporalities that are contained, but invert from within the temporality, the time space of Western European modernity. And it's tempting, maybe perhaps a little fanciful, to draw an analogy between uh, Picabia's drawing here of the mouvement Dada mm -hmm. and uh, Dada's temporality. Here in Picabia's drawing with Dada, in this wheel, and here as a battery, a separate it connected up with the mainstream of modernism and its combined energies trigger a time clock mechanism. That somehow sets off here Picabia's own Dada Venture, 391 is journal. And I think the analogy might be uh, Dada being out of sync, yet remaining within the framework of modernism and modernity continues to release the energy of a sort of time switch mechanism that might um, prompt us to rethink and reconsider the protocols of modernist historiography. Thank you very much.